This is Twit. Starliner worked. That's right. Now I can't That's even right. remember. Did, <laughs> you, did we you ever have so a bell to be able one? to say that? <laughs> I don't think I bet you for your chair on Starliner because it was so uncertain. But uh, we had a successful launch. Yes, we had a successful uh, rendezvous and docking with the space station. After a few glitches, some, but yeah, after yeah. some issues with thrusters, which may be related to software or and i haven't read for certain that it wasn't valves <laughs> and i just you know i we'll, I, I, we'll talk about that we'll talk about that because okay. it was an interesting evening press conference last night talking about the the, the thrusters themselves etc so we'll talk about it so okay well so starliner worked we're all you know cheers to boeing they cer- certainly have succeeded in not making it look easy, mm-hmm. but it did work. And the astronauts are up, Butch and Sunni up there, and they're safe. And cheers, cheers to uh, Boeing and ULA for having achieved this. So this was on uh, Wednesday morning. Yeah, Wednesday, June uh, 5th. June yep. 5th. And then after- they dragged their heels for 24 hours and finally docked, rendezvous and docked on Thursday. And, um, you know, I guess we could say that the the caution, which at this point would be, um, I say caution, delays, whatever you want to say, about eight years past their first projected flight date, I think, which yeah. is a long time when you got it a is. contract like that. But if that's what it takes to do it safely, uh, it's worth it. And well, I. I think there, there's there's cause for the first. Let's talk about the launch itself because there's a, there's some things I wanted to to, mm-hmm. to bring up. First of all, uh, uh, space. Uh, sp- I was gonna, I almost said SpaceX. Uh, first of all, Starliner launched on uh, an Atlas V rocket, Boeing Starliner. It's the first time, uh, and they launched from um, it's they launched from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which is uh, weird. Yeah, space. Yeah, uh, Launch Complex Forty One. Uh, it's the first time in like, uh, what, like about 60 years that uh, astronauts have launched from uh, the, the the Space Force Station, previously the Air Force Station, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it's the first time in um, uh, many different vehicle programs that an astronaut has launched on an Atlas V rocket as well. Uh, so so need- if, I may, if I may interject for people who haven't been to the Kennedy Space Center, we're always used to seeing the crewed vehicles, rockets, shuttle, Saturn Vs, uh, and now Falcon 9s, leaving from pad 39, either mm-hmm. 39A or 39B historically. And that's kind of, um, I guess, uh, what you'd say, it's just slightly southeast of the vehicle assembly building Canav- cape canaveral is it used to be canaveral air force base and now i guess it's a space force base yeah is further south from there and that's the one you see in the aerial photo sometimes with like a whole row of launch gantries right yeah and that was always for unmanned rockets uh, uncrewed uh, uncrewed Rob. uncrewed uncrewed oh my god i <laughs> as an editor i bust people for that all the time i can't believe i just said that uncrewed or non-human space flight thank you um so so this was kind of a one-off and then the atlas you know uh, people argue well we've launched people on atlas uh, rockets missiles at the time before but that was the old atlas that was the thin skin stainless yeah. steel atlas that launched john glenn and the others on the mercury flights when they got off the redstone, but never on the Atlas V, which has no relationship to the original Atlas except the name and a company. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of a lot of space history and potentially a harbinger of things to come, because uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force uh, uh, Station uh, is also home to SpaceX launch pads, and they are upgrading their own uh, uh, their own pad there to be able to accommodate crewed flights as well. So what we saw with this this first Boeing Starliner flight is something we could see a lot more of uh, in the future with these private companies launching from the Space Force Station. So so that was pretty inside, exciting, uh, to say the least. A very smooth countdown uh, on this last time, uh, which was interesting, uh, not, not too much uh, uh, to, to write home about. The only kind of annoying part, and uh, we could talk about this later too, but once they l- launched the thing, once they launched into space, that was it. We didn't see uh, uh, Sonny Williams or Butch Wilmore inside the spacecraft on or, the way or up. The, like, or the weightlessness or, stuffed animal or whatever it, they were going to exa- do, right? Exactly. And that's something that persisted for the entire 26 hours of their flight to the space station. Uh, so so that was fairly annoying. And uh, it seems like it may have been a choice 
like an, an oversight made by choice to not do that because Mark Nappy, Boeing's Starliner pro- uh, program manager, says, well, they're looking into the ability to provide live in-cabin video. They can't do it for some reason or another on this flight, as well as the next two flights they said it could take, which I find very weird because... Apollo missions broadcast live live television from the moon, you know, in, in the in the late sixties and seventies. So you would think that they could they could figure something out. But um, well, uh, having having had a series of British sports cars when I was a younger man with electronics by Lucas, which anybody who's ever owned an old British sports car knows, the appellation the Prince of Darkness was well reserved for Lucas. I'm convinced that somehow. You know where I'm going. Boeing was working <laughs> with some supplier that just couldn't get their valves right. But uh, you know, why that would affect video is is an interesting question. Um, yeah, the, I don't uh, know. But 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 aside aside from that, I mean the the it was it was a very good launch. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of the issues on the Atlas V side with the United Launch Alliance, the mm-hmm. um, uh, the the issues with the computer card that that thwarted the. Uh, uh, the earlier attempt, they got a lot of that stuff kind of squared away for this try, right. and um, and it was all it was all uh, uh, set to go. So um, so now we're in this test phase. You know, there there were should we, should we talk about the issues? All Hit right. me, my man. Hit me. Uh, all right, so so good launch finally on June fifth. Of course, they had delays in uh, in May and in uh, uh, again on the on the first. Uh, a good uh, good approach. Uh, uh, later that I think they went to s- the astronauts, uh, Butch Wilmore and Sun. Oh, by the way, we, I didn't say Sunny Williams is now the first female astronaut ever to fly uh, as a test pilot on a, on a spacecraft. So that's a another another historic uh, moment too. Wait, wait a minute uh, on on something other than the shuttle. You mean no, like like to on a, a, a she's the first female astronaut to be the first to fly on a new vehicle. Does that make sense? The first, wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> to test, basically the test, to fly on a, on a test yeah, flight yeah. Of, a, of a brand new Oh, I see, I see, okay, okay, got so it. She's, she's the first yeah. woman to do it. Um, yeah. So uh, so again, big congrats. Also, she was the first person to run a marathon in space. She ran the Boston Marathon when she was on the space station uh, during a previous increment. On, by on the way, Stephen Colbert's face. <laughs> by the way, both uh, both Sonny and Butch are, are veteran space station astronauts. So this is a homecoming of sorts for them. Yeah. So... So we've got the launch, we've got the ascent, and then as the crew is getting ready for bed that first night, there is a call from ground control. They have detected not uh, not one, but two new helium leaks in <laughs> in the the propulsion system, very similar to the one that they knew that they already had before uh, launch, and, and that they said that they could they could deal with it. Uh, so it's very frustrating. They have to figure out what to do because they need they need to have a supply of helium. In, to come uh, home exactly right yeah. they, they, they they have they need like 96 hours worth of of helium uh for the like to achieve the mission and mm-hmm. so they budget for that and and, uh, and what they ended up doing was turning off the manifolds that that helium goes into so that that way the helium can't even get to where it's leaking out of and they did that overnight and then they turned them back on on docking day which was uh thursday uh, mm-hmm. uh june 6th as we're recording uh when the astronauts would need to use the thrusters, so that that way they can they can conserve the, the helium itself. And then when they dock to the space station, they turn off the manifolds again, and then uh, they can turn them back on when when it's time to come home. And Mark Nabby said, like at the end of it, that they've got something up between 135 and 175 hours of uh, of this this helium supply uh, left now. So they've got like plenty of it. They don't have to worry about these leaks ever again. It's going to take something like like 12. 12-ish hours, 16 hours, something like that, to, to just to get home so they don't have to worry about like the double days it took to get there. Uh, and so that's one thing. But they, they just, just want to understand why these leaks keep happening because one leak on the ground is one thing. Two leaks is another. And then after they docked, they found a fourth leak, Rod, a fourth leak in, uh, of, of this helium uh, in, in this system. So they're suspecting there could be some kind of common cause that they didn't think of on the ground that is happening in space that they can try to pin down. And they're going to look at that when they get the capsule back uh, after um, after the end of the mission itself. So so that was one thing. That was one thing. Uh, and in fact, it was it was uh, uh, of an issue uh, so much that uh, Butch Wilmore asked first thing in the morning, what's the deal 
with the Helium League. And then that's when they kind of outlined their plan about turning off the manifolds when they don't need them, turning them on when they do need them, and then uh, and then they can work it through it that way. But during dock, dock op- operations, they lost five aft thrusters on the service module. And uh, and this is, if this sounds similar, it happened during OFT2. They lost a series of thrusters and they had to turn them off, turn them back on again, and, and try to isolate it. And then they, they ended up working the rest of the flight. So NASA and Boeing both, they don't understand. Steve, uh, Steve Stitch said, you know, they, they can't figure out why this is happening. They want to understand it, but it doesn't seem to be a problem in the thrusters themselves. Boeing says that there may be something in the settings, basically the software governing this whole reaction control system, that they haven't, that, that it's used a different software set uh, between orbital insertion and the rendezvous up, something that happens in that phasing that is affecting these thrusters. And then it, 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 the system says these have failed to off. It, the thrusters themselves work, but the system says, I don't like the way that, I'm, that these are set up. I'm going to fail them to off and turn them off. And then Boeing has mm-hmm. to test them each. And what it did was it delayed docking by like an, an hour, uh, at least an hour. You know, it could have been worse, but um, but Butch Wil- Wilmore and Sonny Williams, they had to um, uh, mm-hmm. they had to do some some kind of fancy fancy uh, uh, free-flying to test each of the thrusters individually to make sure that they work. They were able to recover four of the five, and the fifth one, they just turned off for the rest of the mission uh, before they could do it. They even put the Starliner in free drift for a while, so just floating around off, you know, a a couple hundred meters off the the port of the the bow of the uh, space station (laughs) while they figured it all out. Uh, And then he was able to fly it in uh, for for the docking. So, and that, that went smoothly. But, you know, those are the two kind of core... Issues. The cooling system used more water than they had ex- expected, but future uh, Starliners, they said, are going to have um, a bigger water tank. They use a sublimator that creates a block right. of ice that then sublimates to make the cooling, and they just burn through the water, I guess, the block of ice faster than they thought. So those are the three kind of big things that happened. And um, the, NASA and Boeing, they don't seem too worried about them. You know, I, I thought about Starliner and Boeing this morning as I was heating up my breakfast because I was standing in front of my stove thinking, wow, look at that. It's a gas stove. <laughs> and I thought, look at how the valves work. I can turn them <laughs> on. I could turn them off. And when they're off, nothing leaks that I can tell. What an amazing accomplishment in the industrial age. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>